You're listening to Payments Innovation, a podcast dedicated to helping business leaders navigate today's global digital economy. Looking to learn about the latest innovations within fintech and payments? You've come to the right place. Let's get into the show. Welcome everyone to the Payment Innovation Podcast. I'm really excited to have a couple exciting guests here today. Uh, my name is Kara Hayward, and I am working on the mini series called FinTech Karaoke, <laughs> which really is just focused on partnerships in the FinTech space. Um, I also have with me today Marcel Klimo from uh, Vacuum Labs. He is the tech evangelist there. And then I also have Arshi Singh, who is our head of product for North America at Currency Cloud. Welcome, both of you. Thanks, Kara. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Absolutely. Um, so what I'd love to do to start is actually have maybe both of you do a quick intro and a little little bit of a bio about you know the company you work for and what your role is at that company. Um, uh, Arshi, do you want to start? Sure. Um, so I work at Currency Cloud uh, as head of uh, product for North America uh, side of our business. I have been with the company for uh, almost nearing five years now. Um, and in my role, I represent the North American customers, uh, as well as I work on our uh, FX and currency conversion side of our product. Uh, prior to this, I've done similar FX product roles at uh, larger banks. Um, in my, uh, I also used to be a developer earlier on in my career. I've done various finance roles. So yeah, um, that's what brings me to FinTech now and I'm enjoying every bit of it. Well-rounded background, love it. <laughs> and Marcel, would you love to provide your introduction? Sure, absolutely. Uh, so no, my name is Marcel Klimo. I'm from the company Vacuum Labs, and we're very much a design and uh, engineering company focused on fintech and payments companies. So we provide engineers, designers, architects, and sort of um, specialists that come in and help build out these uh, these technology companies and help help guide them through that process. Myself, I've been a project manager. I've been in partially marketing role, sales role. So I've been all over the place. So right now I'm the tech evangelist, which is really spanning across operations, sales and marketing, really helping us grow as a company. We operate out of the EU, out of Central Europe, but we have clients all the way across the world from the United States, across Europe, all the way to Tokyo and Hong Kong. So we like to say we are time zone inclusive in how we operate. <laughs> Love that. Yep. <laughs> you have to be when you're a global business, right? Yes, exactly. <laughs> Great. Well, um, so my first uh, topic that I'd love to cover. So we talk a lot about partnering in order to innovate um, you know, fast and deliver innovative solutions to your customers faster than you'd be able to do as a single player, right? And um, so today we'll dive deeper into this topic. Um, so let's say that as a fintech, you've already made the decision um, to expand your offering by partnering. Like what, what happens then? Like what, what, what would you uh, suggest as a next step for a fintech saying, okay, I need some help either building my app, building my website or partnering from an operations perspective or any other manner for that. Um, Marcel, I'd love to hear your opinion first on that. Absolutely. So, I mean, the, the, the vital decision that every business has to make is where they're going to allocate their resources, where they're going to allocate the time of their founders, their key employees, their key people that they brought into the business. And oftentimes, uh, you, a huge part of that is technology. So in many cases, you probably have a technical co-founder or somebody who understands technology to the level that you're actually now putting together a product proposition for the market. However, uh, that CTO or that technology, possibly product person, needs the right people to bring that to vision to life. And although you always have the option of hiring in-house and finding the people to build that for you in-house, that might not always be possible due to time constraints or even cash constraints. Uh, many, many jurisdictions, many parts of the world have a large overheads on hiring people. Uh, both uh, legal, social, and uh, just, just the sheer amount of time that you need to put into it. Um, so this is where companies like ours come in, where we can come in and we can either play the role of that CTO very early on or expand that role of the CTO or support him or her in her decision making very early on um, to build out the technology as opposed to having to hire the entire team internally. That's great. Yep. That makes a lot of sense. And, and Arshi, any uh, follow-up thoughts on that? So based on our experience at Currency Cloud, I think one a key factor is also how quickly you want to scale. 
if you want to do this uh, you know quick enough a uh, hiring is is a time consuming activity and it it can be expensive um, so you you need to consider um, that if you want to quickly scale and then also have the flexibility um, say in a in a recessionary environment if you want to you know then scale back that's the flexibility that you could get with the you know partnering with an external provider great that's awesome Makes a lot of sense. And I think scaling quickly is so important um, in the fintech space when it's moving so quickly, right? And there's, especially in North America, at least what we're seeing where, I mean, every day there's a new concept <laughs> that's being launched and there's <laughs> five people trying to do it. So scaling quickly is so important. Um, <laughs> um, so actually, if we could maybe dig into that concept a little bit more um, in terms of, let's say you have uh, the decision in front of you, right? And, and, and you have uh, the decision between building, buying, or partnering. You talked a bit about scalability, right? And sort of the reasons that you might partner, but what are some of the things that you're thinking about in that process, right? Like, um, you know, obviously I think one, one key thing that comes up a lot is, well, if you're, if you're partnering, you don't have direct control over, you know, the, the folks that are actually building your product and you don't have control over maybe say turnover or what, whatever the, whatever the thing is, can you talk maybe through some of those just different decision-making processes that a FinTech should make as they're making those decisions? So I think build versus uh, partner, uh, uh, you know, some of the key factors that would go into that is the functionality that you're looking to get. How core is it? And uh, and of course, how uh, uh, how easy it is to get from from a partner. Um, so you know, uh, in one of the instances, we considered uh, buying a solution uh, with another provider, but then uh, the requirement that we had was was so niche and so specific uh, to uh, to our company. Uh, that you know, even after evaluating multiple providers, we couldn't find the right fit. Uh, so, so you need to uh, evaluate, you know, how core of a thing or how niche of a requirement it is for you. If it's something uh, that you think is uh, a common industry requirement that you know fairly other competitors or other players would have, then uh, relatively, you know, there's a bigger pool of uh, companies out there that you could partner with uh, to build. So that that's I think is one of the first criteria. Um, and then, of course, the financial, uh, you know, the numbers, uh, is it cheaper to build in-house or is it cheaper to buy? Um, how much time do you have? How much resources you want to put for it? So uh, the whole business case and the ROI, you need to stack that up. Yep. And, and Marcel, this, you might have a really unique view on this because I think perhaps when, you, when, when you're working with a fintech, you're actually maybe helping bridge that gap um, between sort of maybe some of that nicheness of what's needed versus um, you know, what might be available. And so if you, if you could maybe talk about that and how you might be able to bridge that gap um, when they're making that decision. Yeah, that's a very good a good point. I mean, uh, what, what Arshi just mentioned was, was the example of not necessarily building through a partner, but really buying an off-the-shelf solution or a semi-off-the-shelf solution or potentially an open source solution. There's a way of, of, of doing that. And that actually can reduce cost significantly early on uh, for many if there is a product like that available, which from, my, from what I, I understood here, that wasn't necessarily the case. So the question really isn't whether to build in-house or to build with a partner, but really how comfortable you are around control and what control means to you. Because the way we operate, and this is not traditional from what, I, what we see in the marketplace, we like to go very deep into the company and the people become very much like others that are in-house except they quite literally when they come visit they have a vacuum lab t-shirt on <laughs> it's 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 a cultural thing and and um many companies want that feeling of control that they bring those people in house they have them on their payroll they have their computers their everything but there are many hybrids of doing this if you're really uh, if cybersecurity is very important we have clients where they give us their computers and the, the, our people work on their computers and their networks because that is important to them not many but some do in other cases you're when you're talking about control you're actually not looking for physically seeing the people but interacting with them and that we do as well you know we have daily stand-ups we have uh, bi-weekly weekly or whatever it is um, demos we have retrospectives we have everything that you would do in-house except we are sitting possibly thousands of miles away from you possibly maybe not uh we operate out of central europe so we're very much in the time zone of, of europe 
we can wake up earlier to work with uh, with Hong Kong and Tokyo, and we can stay up late, which is what many people, many of our engineers love to do to work with the states. So we're in a sweet spot even geographically. Uh, but really, I think coming back to the control part, it's I think it's about what it is that you want when you're when you're trying to build something, and if it is having people in the same office. I think this entire COVID crisis has shown that. Uh, you are in some way forced to do it now, either way. Uh, so I think this opens up the the conversation to maybe exploring finding somebody in a different part of the world to help you build it if you can't find them locally, which in places like San Francisco is really, really, really hard finding people locally yeah. and being able to pay for them. Yes. If I may add a few things to that, because yeah, uh, yeah sure. just about that. so we work with uh, with some teams that are um, uh, remote, and you know some uh, people who are contractors with us in Eastern Europe, um, and yeah, a few things that we you know that are critical for us. One, coverage in the time zone, because you know we are based in New York, and hiring in New York is expensive, uh, similar to San Francisco. So there is that that element that we want uh, to benefit from uh, cost perspective, but also. Uh, have good coverage in our time zone, um, and then it's it's about the culture as well. When when we talk about software development, uh, you know, at our company we believe very strongly in in good agile practices. Um, so we want to see that cultural fit also. Uh, you know, we we like to work in small scrum teams. Uh, other than you know just the, the software side of it and the technical side of it, and you know the technical expertise or the languages, there's also the mindset of being more agile. Uh, where in a scrum team, there's no there's no team lead as such, you know, everybody needs to contribute and brainstorm and, and challenge each other. Um, that sort of a mindset uh, and a cultural fit is also key for uh, key for us when we look for external providers. Yeah, that makes sense. And actually, that, that, that's a maybe a follow up question that popped into my mind. Can we talk about the agile approach? Because I think um, for a lot of, you know, the tech forward companies, that's been widely adopted. But I, I also think that not it might not be as widely adopted as we realize in the fintech world. What 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 is both of your views on that? And do we think that adoption of the agile mindset is becoming more widespread? Or like like I would just love your opinions on that. <laughs> Marcel, do you want to take a stab first? <laughs> sure, absolutely. So I think the the big shift for many people when they're moving from maybe a very traditional water waterfall based approach or. A, if people don't understand what that means, basically something that is planned out weeks, months, or even years in advance, and just sort of going through it and sort of falling down through a waterfall, quite literally. Um, I think the biggest shift really is that you start understanding that you really aren't as smart as you think you were at the very beginning. And you start realizing that and, and you become more humble in your, in your uh, endeavors you really think about like, what is the bare minimum valuable thing that I can build over the next two weeks or whatever that period is? What, what is it that will at the end transform the application or the product or whatever to something that is more valuable to our end customer or the end user, for whatever I'm building. And it shifts the conversation from meeting milestones that were planned out years and years in a, uh, back or weeks and weeks back and it allows you to make decisions and changes through time. Of course, there are still things you need to meet. There are things and milestones that you need to meet. And this often gets in conflict with additional managerial goals or other goals that are in the organization that are planned out. However, we've been very successful at being able to merge that into something that is quite reasonable and works together in a way that uh, that works really yeah. it, it's not it, it, i think the biggest thing is it's a it's a it's an exercise in humility and trying to understand yourself and not putting yourself into the prison of promises that you made months back that you now can undo through conversation and open conversation with both your team members and your uh, management team Makes sense, yeah. Are she in yeah, um, you know, when it comes to agile, uh, a lot of companies claim um, agile, but you know, the the just getting it getting it right uh, takes takes effort, and uh, yeah. uh, you know, there are various frameworks you could follow. There could be Scrum, there could be Kanban, but but essentially, the heart, uh, the crux of it is that you break down a big 
delivery, you know, that you want to do for your customer, a big product into smaller bite-sized chunks and you deliver them in small steps, you know, whatever we call them sprints, but each sprint, you take a small scope, you focus on it, you deliver it, you move to the next thing. Um, there, and yeah, to the point that Marcel was raising, sometimes you have to balance it with the wider needs of the organization because, you know, from a, a sales perspective, you would want to know by when, you know, this product would be ready. When can I sell it to the, to the customers? And uh, a lot of times with the agile approach, you are uh, building these uh, MVP solutions, you know, minimum uh, viable products. Uh, where uh, there have been studies that have shown that the first iteration of an MVP almost never lands or hits uh, the nail. So then you have to go through multiple iterations and uh, the, the value or the beauty of Agile is you get something uh, out, a prototype out in the hands of the customer uh, as soon as possible so that you can get that feedback. Uh, it has to start with some friendly customers, but you get their feedback quick, you incorporate it. Because um, you know if you work in the traditional waterfall method, what you, designed a, a weeks or months or years ago is almost never going to be applicable in today's world. Technology is moving so fast. Um, so unless unless you're being agile and getting things out, getting feedback quickly, uh, you would not be able to create a relevant product, uh, you know, with using the old methods. Yeah, that, that makes so much sense. Because I, I think your point about having some friendly customers and sort of like the early adopters, right? I think I know at least at Currency Cloud, we, uh, I, I think our sort of our Bible is this thing, is this book called Crossing the Chasm, and it talks about those early adopters, but um, that is only a small group, right? And so it's important to keep iterating as you as you build. Um, that, I think that might bring me to another question here, um, talking about bite-sized pieces. So I know that there's um, kind of debate around building sort of one large monolithic app <laughs> versus microservices. Um, do you guys have opinions on what, if one is better than the other, and maybe there's pros and cons of both? Um, I, I would love to, to, um, to dig into that a bit because I think a lot of, uh, a lot of companies have um, that decision to make as well. Um, so, so Marcel, would you be able to touch on that? Yes, it's a, it's a Pandora, Pandora's box at any developers <laughs> conference. Uh, it's 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 always an interesting conversation um, because when you're starting to build an application, you don't really necessarily know what you, what it is that you're going to be building at the end. Um, I mean, you have a rough idea. But oftentimes starting off with something that would resemble what you're calling a monolith, something that is one application, um, but designed in a way that you might, might eventually want to break it out into services. So thinking about isolating certain parts of it, certain functionality, business rules, data, and trying to isolate it as much as possible from each other and not to introduce um, the sort of traditionally called spaghetti code where one thing breaks here and then something at the complete other side of the application falls apart for no apparent reason. And then you find out that somebody was lazy and they named the variable the same and it just collapses on top of each other. Um, what we often see, especially with our clients, is that very early on, actually building out a microservices infrastructure um, is, is too early to, to understand how we would build it in a way that we're not over-engineering too soon. Uh, it's like you're trying to abstract out things that you don't know yet. Uh, however, you know, this, this, this is the case for, for companies that, that are starting from scratch. However, that's not the case for everyone that we work with. And uh, oftentimes they already have something. And in most cases, it, it is actually monolithic. It, it is something that they build and now they've possibly deployed to the cloud, but it's really just like we move from a server down the road to a server somewhere up, you know, in the sky. Um, so, and what we then start to think about is, is how do we actually move from that uh, from that monolith into something uh, into something that resembles microservices, either due to performance or due to separation of data or many other concerns. And of course, we could do a two-hour conversation on this, on, on all the things that could break and the many different ways you can hollow out a, a, a monolith or try to somehow stitch and tape with hope and dreams that, that, that something will turn into a service. And, and, you know, there's lots of interesting talks and books on this, on the approach. But really, I, th I think the one thing that you need to be really wary of is whether you're designing your application for the customer or for your organization. 
because sometimes the, the, the problem that arises is that you might start designing services not around what is good for the customer or what the customer might need at the end, but rather around what are the four departments that are going to be working on this app? And then those four apartments, each they get their own service. <laughs> I've seen this way too many times to actually think that this is a coincidence, that there's, you know, department A and B have their own service and then C and D share one service. Just because, you know, when the, when the engineers and the architects were sitting down with the teams, there was, you know, one representative from A and B, there was one from C who was also doubling for D, right? So that's why we ended up with three services. So, um, and, you know, this might seem like a funny meme that you hear online about, like, how development happens. But really, uh, we are humans. We, we organize around tribes fundamentally, around organizations, around things that, uh, and, you know, there's a concept of a tribe in, 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 in Agile. So, um, the, it is very tribal in many organizations. So, one thing that you need to consider and really is, Am I designing the application around my organization or am I designing the future microservices driven architecture around a potentially better version of my organization? And that is a massive question and a massive conversation. And uh, that's why I sort of, that's why that's a Pandora's box <laughs> because that actually is a Trojan horse into, into, into breaking apart your company from the inside potentially to make it better. But I think, I think the general consensus in the industry is that there is a general move towards microservices. However, uh, I would be wary about how that gets designed because exactly. you might end up like, what was it? Uber had like a thousand microservices or something. That's just crazy. That's yeah. just like, that's, <laughs> I, mean, mean <laughs> I don't know what they're doing. Uh, and I think they, they even said like, we probably overdid it. We could have just had a database call or something. I don't want to go too technical, but it's really just, we could have made it easier. And we, we didn't worry on Uber, but, uh, but it's, it's, uh, it's, 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 a, it's a Pandora's box really of a conversation. And, and, and uh, yeah. Sorry, Arshi, what's, what, what do you think? <laughs> that was very, very interesting because our organization, we are in that process now. We are breaking down the monolith into microservices. And, uh, you know, when we started, we were much smaller. So unless you're a really small company where you have one, one essentially one big group of team working together on everything, monolith uh, platform would work. But as you start growing, as you start scaling, you break out into multiple teams and tribes. Um, and you have multiple people who are wanting to make changes, release code at the same time. So that's where, you know, breaking into microservices comes comes into picture. And we've been doing that for some time. By end of the year, we'll have about 40. So nowhere close to, to Uber. But um, the big value we've found in breaking it down is has been uh, around ownership. So, you know, multiple, these smaller groups or smaller scrum teams can fully own that, uh, that that's microservice. They can build on it. They can release it whenever they want. Uh, versus having you know a central team that controls all the releases. So that yeah. uh, one, it helps in red of troubleshooting if things break down because it's a modular design. Only a small part of the service would go down. You wouldn't take the whole platform down with you. Uh, it's easy easy to troubleshoot because you can point out you know where exactly things are broken, so the relevant team can come and fix it. Um, and it also shortens the feedback loop. So if a small team is responsible for building something, they can release it quickly, make multiple releases in one day. If, if, if there's a bug, you know, you quickly uh, find the fix, you quickly fix it and release it. You don't have to wait for the full platform uh, release, you know, at whatever yeah. period, periodic intervals you do that. So, so that way there are a lot of advantages, but then there's an overhead, there's a cost. So I found yeah. what Marshall was saying very interesting that, you know, while doing this, you take advantage of all, all the benefits, uh, but don't overdo it because, you know, you and how you organize it, you know, based on customer needs or organizational needs, I think that's very interesting. Um, something for us to think about as well. Yeah. I, I, well, just one thing to point out from what you said is when you're doing that, when you're doing that sort of independent releases to fix things, we found that you need very good management of that regardless. It's not like anybody's doing anything they want because you can very easily break everything anyway because somebody does a breaking change and they don't inform the other squads or other teams or other whatever the whole thing's going to go down regardless it doesn't matter that it's running on microservices because if something is relying on a critical piece of data like for example customer id and the customer id service has for whatever reason decided to make a breaking change and not consult with everyone and not plan it out you're still going to bring out most of the application 
Uh, so uh, it's it's uh, yeah, it's, it's in very good points, Arshi. I, I, uh, it's just the the overhead that comes with it is is can be quite painful. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and I I guess that goes about you know what we were talking about earlier around scalability, right? Like that's as you scale, you got to think through all these things in detail. <laughs> um, yeah. Great. Well, I'm gonna I have a I have a very direct question, um, and this is something that I think comes up at least probably weekly in, in, in talking um, to fintech, you know, the people in the fintech ecosystem, right? And what makes a good API? And this is something I'm actually very curious about as a non-technical person, because I'm just happy to hear sometimes that it is an API that is behind the technology. Um, and so what makes a good one? <laughs> and Arshi, maybe we'll start with you this time. <laughs> sure. Um, so there are various, you know, technical ways to define what's a great API. You may have heard RESTful architecture. That's uh, the way you design APIs. Um, but I think it all starts with user experience. And when it comes to APIs, we're talking about the developers as the user. Um, so the, the simplicity, if you can design and document your API so that, you know, a new developer that's looking at it finds it really easy to use without having to dig too much into your code base. I think that that simplicity talks for a lot, um, and that's why you see uh, you know developers uh, sometimes having strong preference for one vendor's API versus the other, because uh, at the end of the day they are the ones using it. Uh, so the more complexity you can take away, you know, make it more make like hide the complexity, keep abstraction there, and have good documentation. Um, I think that's one uh, key uh, metric for me. Um, and then consistency. So even you know, as you create APIs, your names of the APIs or documentation, try to use similar terms. And you know, everybody is guilty of that. For date, you might use different terms in different places, or somewhere you say use the word customer, other places you say user. So take care of these basic things. You know, have have consistency. Um, reduce the element of surprise. Like they always say, you know, the developer is using. Don't let them be surprised. Oh. I couldn't, can't imagine how this API is working or why it's giving me this input back. The more predictable it can be and the pattern it follows, that makes it um, easy to use. Um, and then, of course, the actual use case. So whatever problem you're trying to solve, you know, the APIs need to have the functionality to, to solve for that. Um, and a good indicator of you know, this is uh, the community around, around that API. If you see good uh, developer community and you know, a lot of people engaging and talking in, in those forums, that's one way to uh, to judge good APIs as well. That's, I never thought about that piece of it before. That's interesting. Yeah, and myself. <laughs> it's yeah. It's it's the user experience of the API is incredibly important. And and Arshu correctly pointed out that the user in that case is the developer, is the engineer, is the architect. Um, so just to add on to that, really for us, uh, one of the first things we ask whenever we're working with an API that we don't know is. Can we get docs? So can we get documentation? And the second thing is, can we get a sandbox that is consistent with the production environment? Can we get something that if we throw things at it, essentially, we get a response that is as close to the reality of the full production environment? Um, and then, of course, the consistency of the actual sandbox with the documentation is also great. Uh, that is not often the case, which is sad, but it is often the case. So, um, you know, having having that, having a documentation that even if it's sparse and has not that much detail, but it is actually what is what we're supposed, to, what we're expecting to get from when we throw things at the API, that is still better than getting a very detailed documentation that behaves completely, or that describes uh, something that behaves very differently than the sandbox or the production that we get. And you will be surprised as to even high, highly valued, highly you know, uh, praised players in the industry who are incredibly inconsistent with their APIs, with their API documentation. And this is, this is something that, um, cannot be understated at planning meetings because so if an API works as documented, we can have a mock-up done like in an afternoon. Like a senior engineer can be like, oh, I need to do this and that and that and then I make that call and that's it. I'm an ex-engineer, even I sometimes can do that. Yeah. Like I can actually bring up stuff and like, oh, this actually works. As opposed to getting a sandbox, which I can get into, once I get into it, it asks for something that is not in the documentation. When then I finally get through the first API call, it gives me an error on some completely random thing. It's, 
it's 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 documentation and sandbox. And one massive thing that only a few APIs have. Uh, one maybe a nice example of what uh, what uh, I've seen in the industry is uh, Stripe, which has a very nice uh, portal for using it. So like you you when you're and more specifically, like when you're integrating that into an e-commerce platform, you can test out, you can play around with an environment that looks exactly like the one that they have in production. And it's a nice UI for the whole thing. So it's not only documentation, sandbox, but also a UI for the developer to not only debug, but actually see the changes. But I don't think that's necess necessary if you have the previous two. Mm -hmm. If those work well, the, the third for a developer is a nice to have. Gotcha. However, if the first two aren't there, it's painful, and you're gonna you're gonna be developing twice, three times, four times longer than than if you had it nicely done. Yeah, that's, <laughs> that's all I really wanted to say to that. I, that makes sense, and and I think that especially resonates in this in the payments world, right? Where like yeah. you're actually moving money around, and um, there's not just the uh, the technical piece to connect you to the payment rail, but it's the actual money going through at the amount of said it was supposed to go to, right? So um, that that really makes a lot of sense. Um, all right, so last question for both of you. Um, I'd love to just shift the gear and talk a bit about trends. Um, so you guys are both, um, you know, very close to sort of the. Uh, as I mentioned before, the fintech industry is, is changing so quickly and there's new trends every day and you guys are very close to that. Um, can we talk about um, what you're seeing as some of the projects that are more in demand um, these days that you might be working on, Marcel? And then Arshi, from your perspective, obviously, you know, you're specifically working on Currency Cloud, but because of our um, exposure to a lot of fintechs, you're probably seeing a lot of trends as well. Um, so Marcel, could you uh, talk about some of the trends of the projects that you're seeing come through? Sure. Um, so I think I think that for for the past couple of years there was a strong trend towards building challenger banks, mm -hmm. building things that are another Revolut, another Chime, another pick your favorite. <laughs> um, and I think what we're now starting to see a shift into is more niche focused banks, which aren't really focused on the general public like maybe Chime is in the U.S. Uh, but rather focused on a very small demographic or a small niche group. Uh, one, one that I can point to is uh, Longevity in the UK, which are focusing on senior citizens. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's focused on that group. It's focused on giving additional services and value to them. Uh, we ourselves as Vacuum Labs ha have our own little uh, side project called Be Money which is a, a, a project focused on LGBTQ uh, community uh, with special benefits and bonuses and, and, and supporting uh, LGBT businesses. Um, uh, but those are just two examples. I think there's many different verticals that you can go after, but I think there's one roadblock for these to thrive in a way that, uh, that is meaningful, and that is the infrastructure. I think we're at a phase where we're going to be building out a lot of this infrastructure throughout the world to make payments, to make accounts, to make cards, and all of this much more seamless to create than what we've seen in the past. Before you needed uh, you know, potentially millions of dollars to launch a card, just like any card, like the best you could do is probably like store co store co excuse me, store co-branded cards. Like, you know, your Target card, your Walmart card, your Walgreens card, uh, but they are fundamentally um, driven by the interchange fee. They're driven by the fact that you can, you're essentially reducing your cost as a merchant, but also uh, taking money from, from the system in a way that, that is uh, using the interchange fee rather than providing, uh, providing a service or a card that has some other additional value on top of it. That was, that was something you could do in the past. And, you know, these co-branded cars have existed for decades now, I guess. So, uh, but it was a very, it was a very top level, very scraping off the top of the benefits you could do. Like there's so many things you could do if you, of course, through all the privacy concerns, get access to the data, to the transactions, to the things that people are doing every day and understanding their behavior so you can better tailor the experience to them, to their demo, to their 
we internally use this term tribe, <laughs> which is like the tribe of people that want to use that financial service. Because, yep. you know, just today I had a call with a guy who wants to do something around mortgages in Europe and how to fix them. So these are homeowners. This is a fintech for homeowners. Mm -hmm. That might be a fintech for people who are now sending their kids to college in a couple of years. So I, I don't really know how this will evolve. This will unbundle and then rebundle and whatever. But I think the trend really is going to be around building infrastructure so that we can see a more thriving sort of embedded finance in the world, which we haven't seen before. It really isn't there. And I think you know your company and the thing that Currency Cloud enables is it it's part of that embedded finance it enables others to build on top of you mm -hmm. and really drive that infrastructure drive that growth for them as opposed to having to build all of that themselves and spend hundreds of thousands or millions of dollars building out that core technology which brings us to the initial conversation which is do you buy do you build or do you buy a product well i think in this case if there's something in the market that fits your needs and the things that you need to achieve, then, um, well, you buy the part that is, uh, I wouldn't say commodity, but the thing that you can buy that, that fits and you build around that. You build for that niche around that. Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah. And Arshi, any thoughts on that as well? I mean, I would, I would echo what Mar Marshall just said that, you know, we are in that, that building blocks economy where, um, you can either spend years building everything in-house and run out of funds, or uh, if you want to get to market quickly, then you know partner with these uh, existing solutions out there. Um, you know, challenger banks. Like I'm preaching to the choir here, but if you're setting up a challenger bank, you want to get to market. You know, you you get the technology there. You want to issue cards. You use an existing banking as a service, vast platform. Um, if you want to do your KYC, there are reg tech companies out there that share. Uh, that give you the ability to uh, to do screening uh, by accessing their APIs. So you're seeing a rise of you know all these insure tech, wealth tech, niche use cases uh, by accessing the building blocks from from various existing APIs. Um, so that's on the business front. On the technology side, some of the trends or projects that we are seeing. We spoke about the trend towards breaking into microservices. Uh, we are also seeing uh, this trend towards you know uh, getting to continuous integration and deployment. Um, so we have a big push in, in our company to uh, use Kubernetes um, to get us to that uh, stage where, you know, as soon as you develop a right support, it automatically gets released and it's out. Uh, again, you know, we spoke about pros and cons of that approach and how you need to be careful. Um, but these are some of the technology trends uh, that are feeding into the overall business trend, um, in my opinion. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah, that's that's fantastic. And I think... That's, you know, from the business side, the, the banking as a service platforms are are where, I mean, there's just unbelievable growth. And I think that's kind of, I think it's great too, because we talked about scalability earlier as well. And that's what allows a lot of um, these fintechs to get to, to market pretty quickly and at least test a real product with their market. Um, and then, and then from there, of course, they can bring stuff in house or decide, you know, how to better scale um, once they have that MVP, but um, the banking of a service platforms are allowing for that in a, in a cost effective way. Um, I also think something interesting is, is some of the um, standardization of technology and processes and obviously regulation too, in terms of some of the payment systems. Cause I think um, as we start to get like Marcella, as you were talking about trying to make it more accessible to create sort of a global product. Right. And I think a lot of times it's, hard to do that. Like we know, we know firsthand at Currency Cloud how hard it was to try to, you know, tap into uh, however many, you know, 38 different countries payment systems. Um, and so I think that will be really interesting trend too, to see as there's more standardization um, payment systems, what, how that's going to uh, affect the growth of fintech globally. But that's our time. So thank you both so much. Um, anything as, as any sort of leaving, you know, leaving comments that you'd like to share with the audience or thank you again for your time. <laughs> Just one more thing to add. Um, we just, and this is going to be very self-promotional, but it connects into what we said. We just put out a, a, a white paper or a guide on how to build a digital bank with cloud native technology, as opposed to just cloud or moving your monolith to the cloud. This is in collaboration with our friends at Thought Machine, which is a cloud 
native core, uh, core banking engine. Um, so that it might further expand on the topic that we just discussed and how monolith, uh, monolith versus microservices and how, how, what the history is there in the banking space. So for those who listen to this and want to go deeper into this topic, I think it's very interesting to find. And I'll, uh, the, the link will be somewhere near this podcast comment somewhere uh, to find it and, and read it. Or you can just go to vacuumlabs.com and it's on the homepage as well. Awesome. That's fantastic. And I think the more content, the better. So we'll find a way to share it with the audience. Um, well, Marcel and Arshi, thank you so much for your time. Really appreciate it. This has been really interesting and uh, we'll look forward to sharing this with our audience. Currency Cloud is an online payments company that makes international money transfers fast and simple for businesses. We're building a borderless future where international transactions are seamless for a better user experience. Discover the world's most trusted payment platform and our toolkit of developer-friendly APIs at currencycloud.com. You've been listening to the Payments Innovation Podcast. To ensure that you never miss an episode, subscribe now on iTunes or your favorite podcast player. Thanks for listening. Until next time.